Yeah, no, that's great. So, so now you are the co-founder of Dynamic Friction Company or DFC. Is that correct? That is correct. Yes. Got it. Got it. Yeah. So I, I want to learn all about DFC, but first, um, I want to discuss your background because you know you've had an unbelievable track record of success of building companies from scratch. Um, so I want to learn a little bit more about about you and kind of your background. So how did you get started in in, in the industry? Oh, I mean, you'd have to go way back to, uh, you know, my father owning a repair shop. I mean, I grew up in a repair shop uh, literally since the day I was born. Uh, you know, that's if I wanted to hang out with my father. That's where I had to be. Right. So I learned about cars and parts and uh, from a very, very young age. And uh, then he he started an automotive dealership. So I learned about that process. And then he had a parts store after that. And so I, I learned every aspect of that business. And then he started importing parts. Uh, so I would go with him on, uh, you know, for all the holidays and uh, you know, whether it was summer break or winter break, I'd go with him on, on sourcing trips to Europe at the time. This was in the 70s. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, I, he needed someone to make a catalog for his, for his business. So he was kind of looking around, well, who could, who could do it, right? So he handed me the work and he got, a, he got me to do the catalog, which, you know, didn't cost him anything. And I had a bunch of fun, frankly. It was... Yeah, Back yeah. in the day when cutting and pasting was cutting and pasting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so how old were you then when you were doing that for your dad? Oh, I, I made my first catalog for him for uh, Alpha Recombi was the name of the company in the 70s. I made that when I was 16 years old. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah. Wow. Nice. So then he, he sold that. Uh, that. That turned out to be a fairly successful business. He sold that. He, he actually started Auto Specialty in 1982. And uh, then... Um, I actually reluctantly went along and only went along when my friend's father passed away and left him with some money and he drug me into that business said, Hey, come on, let's, let's get involved. Let's help your dad out. And so I, I went along with it and uh, you know, that's, yeah. you know, helped my, help my father build that business. Yeah. Now was that, was that like automotive components, like all sorts of components or was it specifically breaking or what was the, the that company? Yeah, good question. Actually, it started out, we started out as a Repco WD. So back in the day, that included water pumps and belts and hoses. And uh, of course, we were struggling mightily. And uh, we said, well, look, what's what's selling here. And so we said, uh, let's let's focus on brakes. And so we got rid of everything else and focused on the brakes. And it was really, um, what really launched it was that back in the day, and this was like 1983, uh, you know, we were working out of a Repco catalog and I guess I can talk smack now because they're not in business, are they? Selling <laughs> breaks. Uh, so it was 1983 and we were looking through the book and uh, we needed a part for, I remember it was like a 1980 Mercedes. It's like, wait, it's three years later and uh, they didn't have the part. So I said, well, we, we could do better because back when my dad was importing, he was importing for people like Brembo and you know, Brody and, or not Brody, they weren't around then, but uh, Carr and all these different rotor suppliers mm -hmm. and they had it right there in their catalog. So we um, started contacting all these sources and started bringing parts in ourselves to service the needs of these customers that, you know, couldn't even get these parts. And these are some basic parts. Yeah. Wow. And then, and then it really got interesting for me anyway, when um, I think a year later, someone had come in and I was working the counter, you know, someone had come in and needed a master cylinder for a Toyota truck and it was a split year. And uh, the, um, so I pulled both parts off the shelf and we opened up the boxes. He had his part, but the parts were the same, you know, I mean, they were the exact same part in the box. And so that is what actually set a light bulb off where I said, well, wait, how many more are like that? So I went throughout our entire inventory, pulled every part, tagged every part, opened up every part. And that's where I went ahead and rather than, you know, and, and made my own catalog because I saw we could consolidate a vast number of parts into into one and in some cases there was one Toyota master cylinder that we took out 12 part numbers you know where the entire industry had 12 part numbers we had one yeah. You know? yeah and to this day that's everyone uses that one part nowadays by the way gotcha so um so we took I mean at the time I took like 600 part numbers down to 400 mm. so it created a kind of a firestorm where you know once our competitors once this got out we started growing it our competitors were putting out press releases saying, you know, don't use auto specialty master cylinders, you'll die. 
<laughs> so it was pretty funny. Yeah, uh, funny. But so that's where the whole thing really took off, and that's it was after that that, that yeah, auto specialists just really took off. So between you know us being able to source parts that no one else had. And, and us being able to consolidate where no one else was, it, it really made, that's really what cemented <clears throat> our name in that business. Got it. So did you later on sell auto specialty? Yeah, so we grew it. Um, and, and actually, so this was in the mid eighties. We sold auto specialty in 1996. We sold that to, um, well, <laughs> we sold it to Kelsey Hayes, who were at, right at that very moment being bought up by Lucas. And then who just right after that got bought up by TRW. So it was a, yeah pretty big firestorm going on there which is really why with all the commotion i decided to leave that company. got it so then you uh did you hang out for a little while or did you immediately start another company well i had a i had a two-year non-compete from the time i left so i sold in 96 i i left in 98 and i was basically twiddling my thumbs for two years <laughs> yeah got it and you know as a you know as a young man then you know my 30s and it was just driving me nuts um you know, to, to be retired, so to speak. Uh, sure. So yeah, I was uh, chomping at the bit to start Centric. And so literally on the second anniversary of that, um, that non-compete date, I announced the formation of Centric Parts. Got it, yeah. So when you started that up, was it specifically friction or was it all braking? Was it just like high performance? Like what was the, the I guess the focus when you first started with Centric? Okay, well, without getting things too complicated. Actually, there was a little, I skipped a little bit of that. So, uh, cause I, I did co-found StopTech. StopTech, okay, yeah. Okay, so StopTech was actually co-founded with me, Steve Ruiz and, and Bob Lee in 1999. And, and to do that, even though it was high performance breaking, I had to get permission from, I believe Lucas at the time, to allow me to do that. And because it wasn't an area of, of breaking that they were involved in, it, they signed off on it. So I was able to start stop tech. Got it. Uh, okay. Yeah, but I was, uh, it wasn't, I, look, I love racing. I love high performance, but you know, I also just love the activity of the replacement parts business. You know I mean? Yeah. There's so much going on. There's so many people involved mm -hmm. and, and performance breaking is a great niche and it was fun, but I just like, uh, I like the, the activity of, yeah of, of the larger break volume. Got it. so then you grew then you grew centric to a pretty fairly large i mean obviously a well-known name within the aftermarket industry well you know we've kind of picked up where we all left off because uh, much of the group came over from auto especially at the time to centric mm -hmm. and you know one by one um well there were certain co-founders with me uh principal among those was dan lelchuk he was he was my partner at uh, a significant <laughs> significant partner that sounds funny, <laughs> but he, uh, he and I were really, uh, really did, you know, kind of the team that, that formed the team that, that built yeah. that company up. And we, we did a really good job. Um, we had great people and uh, customers that were really loyal to us and, you know, followed us uh, mm -hmm. just because of the simple things that we did. We basically, look, we're just a vessel providing best products and services to customers, you know, and, you know, how do you do that? Well, we just did that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So what was your, so, you know, what would you consider like your expertise on this? Were you, were you always kind of focused on the sales side the relationships with potential customers or was it more operationally kind of just like literally, you know, you kind of brought up your sleeves building the, you know, on the people side and the processes. I mean, what was your focus? Well, the big joke was uh, I was the guy that played with parts. <laughs> so uh, really I was just into it, you know, again, uh, tapping into my background of having been born in a shop and raised in a parts store, I just could, uh, I had this sort of, uh, you know, this ability to, 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 to understand why, what works and what doesn't work. Yeah. Uh, I don't have any, I, I mean, I studied engineering in college, but I don't have an engineering degree. Um, I love racing. I love performance. Um, you know, we, so I just would focus on having the best and the latest you know, at a, at a fair cost. Yeah. You know, we weren't the cheapest, but uh, so, so that's what I did basically. I, I, so I, I really collaborated with the supply base and, and brought these products to market. Yeah. Um, you know, Dan was more of the operations and sales. Got it. Uh, so I took care of everything else on the product side, including cataloging, product management, um, sourcing, uh, product development. You know, we ended up getting uh, 
what ended up being three dynamometers because we were testing and developing so often. You know, nowadays we don't need stuff like that because every manufacturer has those things. But I always try to, to be at the forefront of uh, product development. Yeah. So, so you saw, so what year did you end up selling Centric to the APC Automotive Technologies? Uh, well, actually, so APC was formed after I left. We, actually, the company was first sold, um, which is kind of a secret. <laughs> it was first sold in 2008. So we formed in 2000. We sold in 2008 to a private equity group. Uh, but we were still significant partners in the business. So the original group was still significant partners. Um, the, um, then we, we continued to grow the business tremendously after that. And mm -hmm. uh, it just got to the point where, you know, there were some differences of opinion, I guess you could call it anyways, you know, yeah. uh, things happen. And I actually left in, 2000, in May of 2014. Okay. So um, then there were other changes within the company, I believe. And then they, they, they merged together AP Exhaust and Centric. Mm -hmm. that, was, yeah. that was after I left. Got was, it. Yeah. Yeah, got it. Got it. So then now your latest project that you've got now, your latest endeavor is, you know, dynamic friction so I guess before again but we'll get to this but so what what's the you know now that you've had the experience obviously with in the 80s and 90s and you know with centric now 2000 so what's been the biggest difference in starting a company back then early early in your career versus like now is it or is it fundamentally the same is it really kind of the same things or is it vastly different uh, it's it's quite a bit different um, it's far far more challenging today on so many levels I mean I could I could bring up so many things. There's fewer people to sell. The market's consolidated tremendously, uh, you know, in terms of who we can sell. Ah, okay. You know, so that's a big thing. Um, there are, for example, from the time we started Centric, there's literally more than double the amount of part numbers. Okay, so your 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 price of entry is just went up dramatically. And so with each part number, don't forget when you're sourcing them, there's minimum order quantities, those yeah. MOQs. So, so yet your inventory is twice as big. The, um, the space requirements are twice as much. The rents are twice as much from that, from, from that long ago. The salaries are, have more than doubled. Yeah. The wages have not, wages have gone up 50%. That's a whole other discussion of what's yeah. fundamentally wrong with things out there. But, but those have gone up um, and the margins have gone down. Yeah. yeah. So, so you want to talk about challenges. It's, it's uh, not nearly, I mean, it's fun. You know, I'm still enjoying myself, but mm -hmm. it is really, really tough. It's yeah. much, much more difficult Got it. Uh, to do this. Yeah. Got it. So now, so DFC, so, so tell me, so who is DFC and like, I guess, who are your target customers? Target customers are those that we've always worked with in the past. I mean, in, in my experience, so they basically, the, the, the warehouses, the undercar warehouses, um, these are the people that we work best with. We, we understand them. Uh, they understand us, uh, you know, and, and a part of the challenge is because, you know, another thing to consider too is in part answering a little bit more of your, your previous question is that the competition is so good right now. Mm -hmm. You know, the, everyone's raised their game. I mean, whether it's, you don't have situations like you did 30 years ago where someone didn't have a part, you know, for a car that was three or four years old and they were still in the game. That would never happen. Yeah. You know, the quality of the materials that people are getting are so good nowadays. So we're, we're talking about splitting hair. So it's really understanding our customers' needs mm -hmm. and finding those areas where we, can, where we feel we have an advantage. And, yeah. and I, I believe we do. But uh, now we're, we're really splitting hair, hairs because, again, everything's so good out there. Yeah, and your product, you're, you're, you have a whole catalog full of braking components from rotors, calipers, pads, all different components, hardware, things like that. Yeah, we have everything to repair, you know, to, for a full repair of a brake job. Yeah. Know, exactly like you mentioned, yes. Yeah, got it. So that's, that's, that's our claim to fame. You have to have everything for everything. And, and every single part number has to be analyzed to extract every advantage we can get from it. You know, so yeah. uh, we have to show almost by part number how, what we're doing different or better than the next guy. It's, yeah. it's very intense. And that's why, you know, unlike at other companies, we started introducing different product lines. There is no way we could do that here at DFC and, and, and pretend to be good at it. I mean, we have to focus just on brakes. Yeah. That's, that's, just, that's a huge undertaking right there. I mean, with all the technological changes, you have, you know, friction material changes now, what with the copper-free materials coming out and the challenges that that poses. And then you have 
different surface coatings now on rotors, you know, all kinds of different, you know, some for, some for uh, aesthetics, some for, you know, uh, durability, and then, and then the, the impact that has on the friction couple. And so then you have to have a pad that goes with that. And, you know, it makes it fun. You know, automated yeah. braking. Uh, yeah, for sure. It's just yeah. it's a lot of things. Then you have the, the, the electric cars with the regenerative braking, and that has another set of issues that it uh, imposes on, on the brake system. Yeah, no, I was going to ask you that because that was actually a question I was going to ask you. It's was because of technology, because, you know, I've, fundamentally a pad, a rotor, a caliper, you know, hasn't changed much over the years. You know, the function of a, of a, of a pad is the exact same. I know there's different formulations, you know, maybe the shims, the backing plates maybe have changed, but, you know, basically the same. Same thing as a rotor. You know, they've improved the, maybe some technology of a rotor with maybe, maybe making it lighter, maybe making the quality better, maybe it lasts longer, but still it's a, it's a rotor, it still is, is the same function. With advanced braking, now with, you know, advanced emergency braking, um, you've got like pedestrian detection systems, you've got kind of the rear braking, automatic braking, you know, systems. It's becoming much more like software based and much more, uh, you know, uh, you know, brake by wires coming up, you know, you've got the EVs. So from an after, being an aftermarket supplier, is that going to affect you and the type of portfolio you got to have? I mean, because that's more advanced so than the, the do-it-yourselfers, the guy, the, the guy or gal who's under the car or whatever, replacing their pads, getting dirty. You know, the advanced braking things are obviously much more advanced and maybe, you know, maybe a little more difficult for the do-it-yourself or to kind of fix. So obviously that, that type of customer may not necessarily be uh, required, but obviously you're going to have to service those parts at some point. I mean, is that, is that a strategy you guys are getting into? Very much so. So just to, to, to comment on that, though, the actual wheel, wheel end components, just like you were saying earlier, the caliper, the rotor, the pad, it's still there. But what's happened is the, so, so for someone to change the parts, it's no different than it was 20 years ago to change the parts. But the material choices are what's far more critical. I mean, you can imagine material choices got more critical when cars went to ABS. And now even more so as they've gone to the automated braking, because, you know, think about it. Nowadays, uh, a newer car, and it's, it's not just a luxury feature, it's, it's on all base models too now. I, mm -hmm. I think by 2022, it's gonna be mandated across the board. I could have the date screwed up, but something yeah. like that. Yeah. A car is gonna see a hazard and it's gonna go, you know, I know better than you to stop the vehicle. So, and in fact, it can identify a hazard and react to it in two or three tenths of a second, whereas it might take us two seconds. Yeah. So, I mean, basically 10, it can react 10 times faster so the components that are doing the work have to be very specific. So you can, the way we look at it, you, you have to be very careful about the selection of the product that goes in that wheel end, that, that corner now. Mm -hmm. That friction material has got to be as close as possible to what came out of the car originally to match up with what the electronics thinks. You know, if the electronics thinks it can stop in 100 feet, or, or sees a hazard in 100 feet and thinks it could stop in 90, you better put materials in that can do the same job. Because if you don't, and you put materials where now it thinks it could stop in, in, in 90, but it's stopping in 110, you have a problem. Yeah. Yeah. So, so uh, honestly, I don't know how that's gonna work as this thing rolls out and these cars get, starts getting serviced in the aftermarket and someone does get into a situation and they mm -hmm. didn't put the right friction in. I mean, I kind of shudder to think what will happen next. Yeah, you know, not no, just for, for that sure. person, but just from a legal standpoint, what's going to happen to the aftermarket as things like this are addressed? So yeah, yeah we, well, since 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 we started, we've been very focused on that, and we're very very careful about the friction selection. Got it. Um, for our especially for our premium programs. Yeah, and then what about like the EV and regen? I mean, that's a little bit obviously it's a different type of technology. So is is the does that play a role in the friction selection too, as far as like the, the EV, the Teslas or whatever the world? Oh, absolutely. Well, first they have another set of problems. So first of all, they're, they're great because I mean, they do a lot of regen, regenerative braking, right? So you're not even touching the brake pedal much of the time mm -hmm. to slow the car down. Yeah. So that creates another set of problems where because of their lack of use, their biggest problem is corrosion. Yeah. Right. So, so now they, they have to be working with different materials. So, the rotor doesn't corrode and on, on the rotor and then separately on the friction, what they want to do now, they don't want to have or use a typical 
adherent type friction material. They want to use an abrasive, something that's constantly cleaning. So that was kind of funny when we first were looking at this and before we started to get a real understanding of what was going on, we're like, wow, this is a very, very quiet vehicle. Uh, talking about a Tesla, let's say. Mm -hmm. And then they were coming with these typical European low metallic pads, which have a tendency to make noise, frankly. And so it's amazing that on such a quiet vehicle, they'd be using these, these pads. And then it wasn't until a couple of years later, after going to many, you know, these conferences and understanding what's going on, that the OEs, at the OE level, they were putting these types of materials on to, uh, to clean the rotor. That's really what it was all about. It wasn't about, had nothing to do with high performance braking or, or any of the other benefits that you get from that type of material. It was, it was to clean the rotor. <laughs> so it's like, yeah, wow. Yeah. So, yeah. So are they going to start making the pads thinner in a Tesla then? So just so they get you. Well, I mean, they, they could, uh, I can tell you that on just on the Prius, for example, for, for, yeah, the Prius, for example, they, you know, that's a 32, 3,300 pound vehicle. And that uses the same size brake system as the, um, oh, what's that small Toyota? Anyways, it's a 2,400 pound Toyota. Ah. Uh, 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 Yaris. Gotcha. Right. Same pad, same caliper, same rotor dimension, same, basically the same system, but only packaged differently to fit in that envelope, but mm -hmm. the same size. So, you know, Toyota wouldn't do that unless there was a really good reason. Well, they don't need to, yeah. right? So they could use a cheaper system to stop the vehicle. That's, that's, you know, relying mainly on, on the regenerative braking to stop. Got it. Got it. Interesting. So you guys are based in, um, Southern California. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. So, so you right now, are you supplying nationally across the country, all different types of vehicles right now? Oh yeah, absolutely. Our, yeah. our, our business model spans the entire, you know, lower 48. Actually we do sell them in, in uh, Hawaii and in, uh, yeah. Alaska as well. So, so we cover so all 50 states. Yeah. So at some point, are you guys going to be supplying overseas internationally and be the global brand as well? Or are you going to focus for a while in the U S we're going to focus here now. Uh, we do have business in, uh, in Mexico and Central America mm -hmm. and a little bit even in South America. Um, so we do have customers there. Again, m much of that is because they knew our group from before. Uh, so they're, they're working with us. Um, you know, these are people that have been loyal to us and they still are. And uh, we appreciate that. And so we, we help each other out, you know, but it's not our core focus. I think that's something we're going to get to a little bit later down the road. Got it. Got it. Okay, good. Well, so before we before we leave here, just want to talk real quick, finish up. So Apex is right around the corner. So are you yep. guys going to be? I'm assuming you guys will be there with exhibiting at at Apex and or SEMA both. Uh, actually, yeah, R1 division, which is the online division, is at is SEMA. Uh, the uh, DFC is definitely at uh, Apex. We're also at AWDA. Okay. So yeah, we're looking forward to it. It's uh, we love the show. Um, you know more. You know, our dance card's getting more full every year. Uh, yeah. it's, it's fun. It's fun to see something like this work for people. Um, you know, appreciate our work. And, and, and so we love to see it, more of it out there. And it's great. Yeah. It's, a, it's a great opportunity to get the word out. Sure. No, yeah, I bet. Cool. Well, good. Well, good deal. Well, Dino, it's been a pleasure. I really appreciate your time today.